Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here on this uh, New Year's Eve. So, as always, we hope that, uh, you know, Lord willing, hopefully 2024, will, we've all had some rough times in 2023, so, and there'll be more trials and tribulations ahead. That's the nature of life, but, you know, but let's all pray for a better year. Maybe things will, will go better for us, and we certainly hope that all of our sick get better soon because we, we're missing so many people. Um, so I do, you know, everything's pretty much the same uh, this morning, uh, except, you know, I announced at the end that uh, Maverick and Hudson or uh, Lane's grandsons are uh, sick with something, but you did say they're getting a little better, right, Lane? But they, they've been sick the last few days, so remember them in prayers. And then I, I did call Jessie because she wasn't here this morning. Well, she's got it again. So she had it, and then she passed it to her husband, and I said, well, I guess he wanted to give it back to you, and she said, apparently so. So they're, they're passing it back and forth, but she sounded pretty rough. She, she was having trouble with coughing and stuff, and just all that junk that's going around. And um, Joanne said that uh, Cheryl and Lane were very, very sick. I knew, I knew they were sick, but she said they're, they're really having a hard time uh, with this stuff. So. Uh, please keep all these in our prayers that uh, we hope that they can get over this because this, this has been a rough month for sickness for a lot of our members. Uh, so I think that's all I have. I don't have any other uh, updates that I'm aware of. So uh, tonight, Bobby, you have the opening prayer and then Lane, you have the dismissal prayer at the end. So if you would... And I, I tried to get a decent song leader, but that didn't work. Because uh, he's got, this is the fifth Sunday, and so the, they, the young men do services at Eastside. So he had duties down there tonight. Otherwise, he said, yeah, I, I would have been happy to come up. But he couldn't do it because he's occupied down there. So I, I'm sorry, but you're stuck with me again. So we'll do the best that we can. So if you would, turn in your songbooks to uh, number 545. We'll try to lead off of this one, 545. This world is not my home. <clears throat> All right, number 545, let's sing. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in the glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? 
The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Turn over to number uh, 426. <coughs> 426. After this song, Brother Bobby will lead us in prayer. <clears throat> 426. Praise him, praise him. Let us sing. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, Grant it forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here tonight to hear another portion from your word. We pray that each one of us will be blessed and blessed and carried with us throughout the week. We pray for those who are all those who aren't here tonight, those who are sick, those who may be traveling, we pray that they would be able to be back soon. We pray that you would be with those who are very sick and, and are bedridden especially, that they would be back very soon. And those who are traveling, we pray that you would grant them a safe trip to wherever they go. Father, we pray that you would be with all the our military Marines, State Navy, Army, Coast Guard, Air Force, we we pray that you would be with all of us. This is a lonely time for our service members who are overseas and a dangerous time too at times. We pray that you would be with our uh, first responders, our police, our doctors and nurses, all those who are ready and willing to come to our aid whenever we're in a, an emergency. We pray that you would be with us throughout the service, that you would that 
we would be able to have a, a safe night, meaning this is a New Year's Eve. Sometimes there's lots of partying and things gets out of hand. We just pray that everyone will be safe tonight and behave with you. And I pray that you would forgive us for all of our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate that, Bobby. It would be nice for everybody to behave, wouldn't it? Everybody do what they should do. All right. If you would turn to number uh, 446. Number 446. We'll sing this one before the uh, lesson. Number 446, we praise thee, O God. Let us sing. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. All right, the song of invitation following the lesson will be number 674. Have you been to Jesus? Number 674. If you would, be turning in your Bibles to, turn this on, turn in your Bibles to the book of John, the book of John. We'll be in John quite a bit, and I'll be in some other places as well. We'll look at several verses in John. You know, today, in many ways, the world seems to be turned upside down from the way that we grew up and the way we remember it. There are a lot of crazy ideas floating around out there, and especially when you think about the concept of truth. A lot of different ideas about this idea of truth. So there are many people today that will, they will tell you, they will argue that truth is relative, right? That maybe my truth is different than your truth, but we can have our own truths, and that's what they'll tell you. It's different for each person. Truth for them is guided by their feelings. 
Well, if I feel something is true, then that makes it true. You may feel something entirely different. Well, that's okay. That's your version of the truth, and, and I'll have my version of the truth. So they're guided by feelings, just how they feel about something. They don't want anything. Uh, they don't want any kind of absolute truth because they don't like it. They can't control it. They can't mold it into whatever they want. So this idea of absolute truth is something that a lot of people just really don't care for. Now, for example, today in our world, you have a lot of people that are changing historical facts. Well, I don't like the way that event played out, so I'm just going to tell it. I'm going to pretend like it went in a different way because I don't like history. So a lot of people out there changing what's in our history books it's because it's not politically correct they don't like it. You have a lot of other people out there that are trying to change biology, right? Well, I can change my sex or my gender, and then I can change back and forth. Just, you know, again, it's, it's about my, well, how do I feel today? Well, if I feel like this, then that's what I am, and tomorrow I may feel like something different. So people think that they can change that and make it more to their liking, and, th and that's their version of the truth. Well, you and I do not need to fall prey to this kind of thinking. And it is all around us. It's, it's prevalent in the world. But this kind of thinking is a tool of Satan. Okay? He would love for you and me to believe that truth is relative, that it can be different for everybody. And what's true for me today could be different tomorrow if, if I feel like changing it. Satan would love for us to believe that. He doesn't want us to consider the fact that there is such a thing as absolute truth. Okay. Yes, there are some things that fall in the realm of opinion, and you and I can have different opinions, but there's also certain things that are absolute truth. Okay. And where does that absolute truth come from? Do, do I get to decide what it is? No. Absolute truth comes from God, and that's what makes it absolute. God is the creator of all things. He can define what truth is. He has the right to do that. I don't have any such right, and neither does anybody else. So there is an absolute truth. It does come from God, and you and I need to accept that. Okay? If I refuse to accept the truth, that doesn't mean it's not the truth. But so many people, that, that's the way they think about it. You know, years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, I didn't feel like I had cancer. I felt fine. Didn't feel like it. Certainly didn't want it. So was I able to dismiss that? Say, well, I don't really have cancer because I don't know that. No. Whether I accepted the fact or rejected the fact, it wouldn't change the fact that I had cancer. I was better off accepting it. That way you can deal with it instead of denying it. But so many people, they think they can just, well, if I don't like the facts, I'll just change it. So one thing that we need to accept is that your attitude, my attitude, our attitude toward truth will determine our salvation or our condemnation. That will depend on what our attitude is toward truth, and we better develop the right attitude. And that's how serious that this topic is. So tonight, let's, we want to examine just a few things about absolute truth. First of all, I want to start off by asking a question. And that is, what is truth? Okay, well, you're, you're saying there's an absolute truth. Well, well what is it? Can, can we define it? Well, this is a question that Pilate asked to Jesus. If you'll turn to John chapter 18, because Pilate didn't really fully comprehend what Jesus was telling him. So Pilate asked Jesus this very question. He wanted to know the same thing. What is truth? Okay, so look at beginning in verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, or was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? 
And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Right? But the Jews didn't care that Jesus really hadn't done anything wrong. That wasn't their truth. They wanted something different. Well, you need to find this guy guilty of something. But notice here, when Jesus is talking, notice not once but twice, he says, I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth. Here's my voice. Notice Jesus didn't say a truth or somebody's truth, one of a multitude of truths. Jesus told us there is such a thing as the truth. The truth. So he's answering Pilate's question about what is truth. Uh, there is such a thing as absolute truth, and it does come from God. It's not these various other truths that come from men. So what do we notice about truth, uh, absolute truth? First of all, we want to notice that truth is the word of God. So stay there in John. Look at chapter 17, verse 17. Truth is, absolute truth is, the word of God. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So there we have it. What, what is absolute truth? God's word. These scriptures in the Bible, this is absolute truth because God has defined it as such. I don't have any authority to change this and say, well, I don't think this is absolute truth. I'm going to decide what absolute truth is. Neither me nor any other human being has any authority to do that. God has said this is absolute truth. So truth is the word of God. Secondly, we want to notice that truth is the law of God. Turn over to the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 119. We want to look at two verses there, 142. And 151. So truth is the word of God, and truth is also the law of God. Absolute truth, we mean. So look at verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Again, not a truth, it's the truth. God, your law is the truth. Look at verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Okay, so that is the word of God, the law of God, the commandments of God. Those are absolute truth. Nobody has the authority to alter those things. So truth is the word of God. Truth is the law of God. And we also find that God's truth, absolute truth, is indestructible. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. The absolute truth of God is indestructible. It is everlasting. It's unchangeable. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which we saw, that is truth, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God is truth and it is indestructible. It will abide forever. It is everlasting and is unchanging. That is the truth of God. So we have discovered what truth is. So we need to recognize why is it important that we have absolute truth? What, what is so important about it for us, really, I mean, for everybody, what is so important about having the truth of God? Well, let's go back to the book of John again. John chapter 8. What does the truth do for us? Why is it so important that you and I have access to the truth? Well, first of all, we see that the truth makes us free. John 8 and verse 32, because this is what Jesus tells us. John 8 verse 32. Jesus said, and you shall know, again, notice there, the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the truth of God, God's word is truth. God's law is truth. We just saw that. So Jesus said that truth, the truth, that's what's going to make you free. What about any other truth of man, any other truth that I may invent on my own? Is that going to set me free? No. I have no power to do that. Only the truth of God 
is going to set me free. So the truth makes us free. It can free us, it will free us from the bondage of sin. It frees us from our slavery to Satan. Because whenever we're giving in to him and doing the things that we want him to do, we are really his slaves. We are his servants. Well, Jesus said the truth, that's what it will make us free from. The bondage of sin, the bondage of Satan, it will bring us closer to God. We also notice that the truth converts. Look again in the Old Testament, look at Psalm 19 and verse 7. So the truth makes us free, the truth also has the power to convert us. Again, the truth, God's truth, no other truth can do that. Psalm 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord, and we already saw the law is the truth. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, the testimony, again, that's God's word, which is truth, is sure, making wise the simple. So we see here that the truth is what converts us. The truth is what can bring us eternal salvation. We cannot get salvation in any other place but in God's word, in God's truth. So the truth makes us free. The truth converts us. Thirdly, the truth purifies. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 again. We we'll looked at verse 23 a second ago. Let's look at the verse in front of that. Look at verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. We see that the truth, God's truth, purifies us. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying, once again, the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So we are purified, but only through God's truth. And we see here we're purified by obeying God's truth. We'll have more to say about that in a couple of minutes. But we can't be purified, we can't be cleansed in any other way except through God's truth. So his truth makes us free, his truth converts us, his truth purifies us, and God's truth furnishes not some, not most, but all of our needs. We're in 1 Peter, turn over to the next book, look at 2 Peter chapter 1, notice verse 3. God's truth furnishes all of our needs. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. The knowledge is God's word, God's law, which is the truth. And it says that that has given us all things which pertain to life and godliness. So what else do we need Besides God's truth, spiritually speaking, nothing. There's nothing out there. Well, God, I wish you'd have given us this or you should have added that in. There's nothing left out that we need. God has given us everything we need in his truth. So for all these reasons, that's why it's important for us to understand God's truth, to have access to it. Uh, to it. And we want to notice also that as far as God's truth is concerned, it should not offend us. And you have so much of that today that, that people are offended, right? If you try to talk about the gospel, you try to talk about God's word, so many people are offended by that because they don't want to do it. They don't like it. Well, we've got to understand that we should not be offended by God's truth. Okay? And I don't, I don't know if y'all can read that, but I thought it was a good quote. Don't water down the gospel. If the truth offends, then let it offend. People have been living their whole lives in offense to God. Let them be offended for a while. All right, we're always offending God. Well, maybe we should be offended. But we really shouldn't be offended by the truth because the truth, as we just saw, it's what it furnishes all our needs. It's going to save us. So why should we be offended by it? And yet so many are. So let's go back to the book of John again, John chapter 8. If we want to notice that to receive the truth, to receive the truth is to receive God. Look at John 8 and verse 47. John 8 and verse 47. 
He that is of God heareth God's words. Again, God's word is the truth. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So to receive the truth, that means we are receiving God. If we will not receive the truth, if we are offended by the truth, that's saying we will not receive God. We've rejected God is what we've done. To receive the truth is to receive God. And so if we reject it, we've rejected God. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we reject God, if we reject truth, it means we have rejected our salvation. That's exactly what it means. So look at John again, chapter 12. Let's look at verse 48. To reject the truth is to reject our salvation. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Remember, what's God's word? It's the truth, right? So we're told here we will be judged by the truth. So if I reject the truth, I'm going to be condemned in the judgment because what I've done, I've rejected God in favor of my own truth. Well, I don't have the power to save myself or anybody else. So I cannot be offended by the truth. So to receive the truth is to receive God. To reject the truth is to reject God. To love the truth is to love God. Staying there in John, look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, let's look at verse 21. To love the truth is to love God. He that hath my commandments the truth, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Again, the words of Christ. So he tells us here, if you have the commandments, if you keep them, if you've accepted the truth and you obey the truth, then you are demonstrating your love of God. So by the same token, that obviously means, well, if I'm not accepting God's truth, if I'm not obeying God's truth, then how can I say I love God? I mean, I can say it, but it's not. Again, that's my own version of the truth, right? If I say, oh, I love the Lord, but then I don't believe in his word, I don't obey his commands, then I'm speaking my truth, which is really a lie. I'm doing nothing but deceiving myself. I'm not speaking the truth which is what God wants me to do. So to love the truth is to love God. So we've seen what the truth is. We've seen why it's important to have it. We've seen that it shouldn't offend us. Well, if the truth shouldn't offend us, what should it do? Well, let's close out with that tonight. We should not be offended, but what we should do is believe and obey the truth. That's what we had better be doing. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Because we see that obedience to God's truth, accepting it and obeying it, that is what makes us acceptable to God. If we refuse to do that, there's no way that we will be acceptable to God. So obedience makes us acceptable to Him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect complete in the faith, doesn't mean without mistake, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Okay, so the author of eternal salvation, but who's that for? To all that obey him, because we're told we need to be perfect in the faith too, but not perfect in the sense that Jesus was, but again, for us, it's mature in the faith, complete in the faith. But he's telling us that the salvation is to all those that obey him. All those that accept God's truth and obey the truth. That's what makes us acceptable to God. Because we want to notice a couple of things. Again, the world teaches something different. But what we learn in the Bible is we have to have obedience to the truth because grace by itself is insufficient. Grace is insufficient. God's grace. What? We, you're saying God can't save us through His grace? I'm saying God won't save us through grace alone. Oh, He could, 
but that's not the way he set it up. He himself said his grace is not sufficient. Now, do we have to have his grace to be saved? Oh, absolutely. None of us can ever achieve salvation without the grace of God. We have to have it. But God himself said his grace alone is insufficient. We have to have more than that. So look at Philippians 2 and verse 12. We have to have God's grace, but we have to have obedience as well. That's what goes with it. Okay, look at Philippians 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we see here, You've obeyed. It's an obedient faith. And said, so you've got to work out your salvation. There's nothing in there that, well, don't worry. The grace of God is going to save you. You don't have to do anything. Could the grace of God save us without nothing else? If that's the way God had set it up, certainly. But God is the one who determined there's more to it. We have to have his grace, but that's what he does on his end. You and I are commanded by God to do something on our end. So grace alone is insufficient. We also find that faith alone is insufficient. Yes, we have to believe in God. The scriptures tell us. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we have to have faith. But faith alone will not save us. Why? Because that's the way God set it up. That's his system. So look at James chapter 2. We want to notice three different verses in James chapter 2 that make it clear that faith alone is insufficient, just like grace alone is insufficient. James 2, beginning in verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Works is what we do on our end. Okay, We have to have faith and we have to have works. And if you don't have the works with it, then your faith is dead. Look at verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So the world will tell us today that, oh, faith is all you. As long as you believe, then Jesus is going to save you. Well, that verse right there, James 2 and 24, might interest you know, that's the only verse in the Bible where you see the words faith and only together. The only time. And what does it say? Not by faith only. It's the only time you see it. But yet the whole religious world would have, oh, you can be saved by faith alone. You can be saved by faith only. It's not what God said. Now, look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. All this goes together. We have to have the grace of God. We have to have faith. We have to believe in God. But we also have to do works, right? We have to have an obedient faith. If I don't do anything with my faith, it's not going to do me any good. The Bible tells us, look, the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe in God. They've seen God. But is that going to save them? No, because they, they weren't obedient. They didn't do what God told them to do. So their faith, they've got plenty of faith in God. It's not going to save them. And it's not going to save you and me either unless we do what God tells us. So obedience will make us acceptable to God. Grace alone is insufficient. Faith alone is insufficient. And one last thing we want to notice tonight is that we will face serious judgment by God if we pervert the truth. The truth is, as we've seen it tonight, if we change any of this, if we alter it in some way because, well, I'd like it better if it, if it was this, we will face the judgment of God because we have changed the truth into our truth, my truth or your truth or, or somebody else's truth. So look at Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Galatians chapter 1 starting in verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Well, is there really another gospel? Look at verse 7. Which is not another. 
The answer, no, there is no other gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. We have given you God's truth. Now, if we change course next week and we decide to tell you something different, he said, even us apostles, we need to be accursed if we do that. If an angel came down from heaven and told you anything different than what we've told you, because what we told you, we got straight from Christ. We got from the Holy Spirit. And if we or an angel tell you anything different from that, let them be accursed. Because there is not another gospel. There's only one. There is not another truth. There is one absolute truth, and God defines what that is. So every single person on this planet, every single person, regardless of where they are striving to be a saint, they are striving to follow God, which is what you and I are doing. That's why we're here, so we're, we're trying to do that. Whether it be that kind of person or a heathen sinner out there that, that has no interest in God, whoever it is, everybody needs to examine their own heart. Everybody should examine that. So we need to ask our question, what is our attitude toward the absolute truth? I need to ask myself that. What is my attitude toward truth? You need to ask yourself, what is your attitude toward absolute truth? Are we accepting of the absolute truth of God? Or do we rebel against it? We need to seriously contemplate that. In, in my lifestyle, am I rebelling against God in any way? Or am I really trying to do His truth, what he, he told me to do? Am I seeking my own version of the truth? You know, there's plenty of people out there that they already believe something and then they try to twist the scriptures to fit what they already believe. Well, we can't do that. I, I need to fit my beliefs to what the scripture says. And if I find out that I'm wrong, well, I need to admit that I'm wrong, and I need to alter my beliefs to go along with what God has said. We don't need to seek our own version of the truth. We'll leave you tonight with one last verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and 11. We have to accept the truth of God. We have to embrace the truth of God. Because as I said earlier, whether I accept it or don't accept it doesn't change the fact that it's the absolute truth. So I might as well accept it because that's the only way I'm going to get my salvation. If I refuse it, then I'll never get it. So we have to do that for ourselves. But more than that, we have to strive to teach others the same thing because souls are at stake. We've got to let other people know, yes, there is an absolute truth. And the only way to be acceptable to God, you have to obey that absolute truth. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We persuade men. Your job and mine, number one, is to obey the absolute truth, but number two is to teach that absolute truth to others. They may reject it, but that's not on us. What's on us is to try to share that absolute truth with people because hopefully we have a love for their souls and we don't want them to be lost. And we don't want ourselves to be lost either. So in this crazy world where we've got everybody telling us there's, there's 10 million different kind of truths out there, that's the world we live in. But may God grant us the strength and the courage to stand up for his absolute truth. And the absolute truth is that if you're not a Christian tonight, then what that means is you are lost. You are, your soul is in a lost condition. And if you were to die in that condition or the Lord were to return, then you would be condemned to eternal torment. That's unpleasant to think about, but that is God's absolute truth. So if you're not a Christian tonight, you need to fix that. You need to become a Christian. We can baptize you into Christ. God will add you to his church. If, on the other hand, you are a Christian, but you've deviated from that, you have fallen away from God's absolute truth, and you've been kind of doing your own thing, you need to stop doing your own thing, you need to do God's thing. 
Because again, that's the only way you can obtain your salvation. And, but if you'll come back, the good news is God wants you to come back. He's pleading with you to come back. He wants to forgive you of those sins. And if you need to do that, we can help you with that tonight as well. So if you need to become a Christian or you need to be restored, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Number 674, have you been to Jesus? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Pure and white in the blood of the Lamb. Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I don't believe we don't have anybody that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper, do we? I think everybody was here this morning. All right. If you would, be turning to number 46. That'll be our closing song, number 46. Please remember all the sick that have been mentioned and, and that were up on the board on our continuing prayer list. Let's pray that they get relief soon and, and they will be restored to a better portion of hell. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, hope that you will be here on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. for our midweek Bible study and then again, of course, uh, next Sunday morning. We hope that you all uh, have a safe drive home and don't encounter any of the craziness that might be going out there tonight. And we wish everybody a, 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 a blessed new year from our, our Lord and Savior. So we, we appreciate you all very much. Thank you again for being here. So number 46, blessed be the tie that binds. We'll sing the first verse, then Brother Lane will lead us in a closing prayer. Let us sing. Blessed be the tie that binds. Our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that of.